Oh, welcome to the participant training for AGU's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or DEI, Virtual Advocacy Days. Uh, my name is Michael Villafranca, and I am the Senior Specialist uh, on AGU's Public Affairs team, as well as your moderator for today's training. So our goal today, uh, our goal for the event uh, is to provide each of you an opportunity to build a relationship with your policymakers while furthering policy that will support greater diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in science. So during part one of today's training, staff from AGU's public affairs and equity, diversity, and inclusion teams will go into the issue of DEI in science uh, more in depth and will give you more background into the federal bills being promoted. Part two, after the break, will provide more insight into developing your message crafting skills and cover tips and best practices uh, to help make each of your virtual meetings a, su a success. Uh, so before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items to cover about this training. Uh, first, today's two-part training uh, two -part training will run for approximately about two and a half hours, including a 20-minute break in between. Uh, second, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, however, we'd love to hear from you to, uh, during today's training. Uh, question and answer sessions will be held periodically during the presentations and at the end of the training. If you have a question during the training, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to type it in. And finally, this training is being recorded and will be sent to all participants after the training. So please be on the lookout for an email uh, in the next couple of days from your designated AGU point of contact with a link to that recording. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, AGU's Senior Vice President of Ethics, Diversity and Inclusion, Billy Williams, who will start us off uh, with a reflection. Off to, uh, over to you, Billy. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Billy Williams. Again, I, I serve as Vice President for Ethics, Diversity, and Inclusion at AGU. I work closely with Margaret Fraser, who's going to actually lead you in the discussion of the, the importance of DEI in science. But today, uh, we could not start this important session without some reflection on what's happening in today's events. The things that have been happening around uh, uh, post the uh, uh, killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, all the things leading up to that and all the aftermaths of that. Uh, so we're not immune from that. I'm not immune from that. I personally have been uh, impacted emotionally about what has happened. So we have had AGU statements on what has happened, an AGU statement and, and, and other follow-up actions, but we're at a point now where we're moving beyond making statements. But I thought you would be, want to be aware of that. We do not want to have this discussion distract from what you're here today to discuss. You signed up for this uh, session on advocacy, uh, using DEI and advocacy long before these events started to happen. So we want to uh, be sensitive to and aware of that. But I just wanted you to be to know that AGU is keenly uh, supportive, is on board. Uh, we're doing things uh, to align ourselves with uh, recent activities. Uh, we just announced to our staff uh, a few minutes ago that we're supporting sh uh, Shutdown STEM Day tomorrow. Uh, and we are also signing on to a statement that was released from uh, geoscientists of color asking for specific actions to take place around these issues. So we can be happy, we'd be happy to provide the link to that uh, call for action uh, from our geoscientists of color. A lot of those, uh, some of the co-authors on that are actually members of our AGU Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. And I saw some messages in the chat about wanting to know more about what we do with our committee, DNI committee at AGU. Uh, again, we'd be happy to follow up with you on discussions around that, around uh, what work is being done in that committee, uh, post this meeting, I see a couple of members from that committee on this on this uh, call today. So we we I'm very proud of the work that's happening in the AGU DNI committee. They're very proactive, very forward looking, and having tremendous impact. Uh, so I just wanted again to acknowledge what's happening today. Let you know that AGU is is uh, responding. Uh, it, it's it's these are very involved issues, complicated issues. Uh, there's an AGU council meeting on Thursday of this, of this week where this is now a late breaking item on the AGU council meeting agenda in follow up to some uh, very uh, 
concrete discussions on the issue of race in STEM that we held at our March AGU Council meeting. So uh, we are stepping into this topic, into this space very, very boldly, but we recognize that it's, we're in this for the long haul. So we, uh, we applaud you for being part of this discussion today, uh, and we welcome your engagement and interaction as we go forward. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn this over now to get back into the heart of the reason you came to this, uh, to this session and turn it over to my colleague, Margaret Fraser. And um, Margaret, I'll let you introduce yourself, uh, but Margaret is fairly new to AGU, so you've been with us since April 1st. But I just have to say what a tremendous asset she is to our organization, and, and uh, I can't be more happy than, than to have her as my colleague here at AGU. So Margaret, I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Billy. Um, hope you guys can all um, hear me and see me okay. Um, I'm going to uh, read the chats um, for your input on that. Um, so thanks for the intro, Billy. Um, I'm a geoscientist. I was a professor for 12 years um, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and then I was a program director at NSF for a couple years, and I've been here for two months, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be working with um, Billy Williams. Um, so today, Billy and I have put together some slides that we hope are ways to spin up some topics for you to have conversations with your policymakers. We also include an anti-racism toolkit in the Google Drive for further reading and listening on how to take action towards dismantling white supremacy. And the first thing we want to do, and I'm going to, it did work, great. Um, the first thing we want to do is we want to start by showing this two-minute film trailer. Picture a Scientist is the title of this documentary, and it contains candid conversations with a, geolo a geologist, um, one you might recognize, a chemist, and a retired biologist to examine workplace harassment and discrimination. This, docu this documentary highlights the need for a culture of change, and we think that it's a good setup for discussing the three bills later on today. All right, so fingers crossed this works. All right, thanks for your patience, everybody. So I'll include a link to that trailer in the, in the Google Drive document. So we're gonna just um, keep moving forward. Um, so um, for this next slide, sorry, <laughs> we have so many people with um, access to the slideshow. So um, for this slide, um, at every educational transition and career milestone, persons from minoritized groups are underrepresented. Um, and these could be, Billy and I are, are thinking that some of these um, topics could be brought up with your policymakers. So minoritized groups, and I realize that this is a, we're speaking with a group of people who already care deeply about anti-racism and DE&I best practices. Um, but just to get us all on the same page, minoritized groups are those that are um, in races or religious creeds, nations of of origin, um, have um, sexuality or gender that is, um, as a result of social contracts, have less power or representation compared to other members and groups in society. In the U.S., minoritized groups that are underrepresented in STEM are persons with disabilities, persons within the African American, Hispanic, Native American, and Alaska Native communities, and women. Um, I just found a few statistics um, that you may want to share with policymakers. 39% um, of the college age population are persons from minoritized groups, but only 18% are those who earn bachelor's degrees. So that's a, a big gap. In the United States, women made up 50% of college educated workers in 2010 but only 28% of science and engineering workers. African-Americans, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Hispanics 
collectively form 26% of the population, but only account for 10% of science and engineering workers. Women make up just 26% of the computing workforce and 12% of the engineering workforce. And of all of these statistics, African Americans, Latinx, and Native American women are especially underrepresented. So taking these numbers, these um, quick statistics, um, and making that case to your policymakers, um, we argue that the entire talent pool must be fully engaged for, um, for a lot of reasons, but we've boiled it down to two primary ones here. The first is that the U.S. faces an acute shortfall in the number of students earning STEM degrees. The reasons for this shortage are varied and complex. Um, they include things like uh, the lack of visibility of STEM jobs, um, stagnant performance of U.S. students in math and science assessments, and um, I'll highlight here as well as the persistent underrepresentation of minoritized persons in STEM fields. Further, one in five children in the U.S. attends a school in a rural community, and research shows that they are disadvantaged with respect to STEM readiness. The U.S., it's been projected, will almost certainly lose its competitive edge in the 21st century in the, with respect to the global economy if action is not taken. So we need to carefully manage investments in research and development, remain welcoming to international talent, and better develop our domestic workforce. And then the second point here, uh, people belonging to groups underrepresented in STEM produced greater scientific novelty. So research, and I'll repeat it again because I think it's so important, research shows that minoritized persons underrepresented in STEM produced greater scientific novelty and innovation. And so not only is engaging the entire talent pool the right thing to do, it's good for the country. So these slides and these statements are not at all meant to be uh, an exhaustive list or an exhaustive compilation of information about barriers to STEM or to fixes. We've put these uh, items together so that you feel a little bit better prepared to speak to your policymakers about the importance of promoting DEI and STEM and ultimately dismantling white supremacy. Supporting these bills is just one step towards dismantling white supremacy and promoting DE&I and STEM. The federal government provides 55% of research funding at institutions of higher education, and it has a significant influence on policies related to institutional culture and structure. These bills that Brittany's going to tell you about next would make sure that federal research and development funding are fully engaging the entire talent pool of the United States. This is just one way that scientists can take anti-racism actions. Again, uh, we've put together some, um, a variety of things that you can listen to or read in the Google Drive uh, for some anti-racist um, actions to take. And the last slide that I have is just a little bit about some resources in case you're um, interested in finding um, more statistics to back up your claims. Think about the districts that you live in, the states you live in, what issues are particular to your place of living. Um, a great source of information is the National Cent Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. They collect and compile, analyze, and publish data on the demographics of STEM majors and persons who go on to have jobs in STEM. And the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine puts out it seems all the time um, a report on issues that are uh, pertinent to this training today. So for example, um, recent ones include sexual harassment of women. So this report here, um, minority serving institutions, um, promoting practices for addressing underrepresentation of women. Again, these are just um, a few of the items that you can go to if you would like to learn more. And Billy and I are happy to um, answer any questions that you may have. So I do see, um, I do see a question here. Um, the issue begins in K-12. If we do not have enough science teachers, 
Absolutely. Um, these bills are advocating for funding for um, science teachers, research on best teaching practices. Absolutely, definitely agree. Uh, Margaret, I see a question on international. Are there any reports on international collaboration? It's uh, from uh, Mark Mogan. And okay. Mark, the reports that are issued here that Margaret shared are from uh, U.S.-based organizations, National Academies and National Science Foundations primarily. So these are U.S.-focused. And, I, and uh, that's a good point. I think we'll have to go in and dig back and search for and bring forth some references on international collaboration because we are short on that. So thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, I see several comments in the chat box about uh, ways to approach this, how it begins in K-12 education, which is so true. Uh, so support in the uh, early years uh, where people form their strongest interest in, in, in STEM is, is really critical as we go forward. Hi, everyone. Um, seeing no other questions, um, I'll go ahead and talk about the current DEI legislative landscape. Um, my name is Brittany Webster, and I am the Program Manager of AGU's Public Affairs Department. Um, and so I'm here to talk to you today about our ask. Um, yeah, so I want to start by discussing why AGU is focusing on specific pieces of legislation during these virtual advocacy days. First, it's because you need to have an ask. An ask is what you want the legislator to do. Why are you meeting with them? In a survey done by the Congressional Management Foundation, congressional staff were first asked how helpful it was for constituents to have an ask. Um, and you can see it's pretty critical to a congressional meeting to have an ask. Second staff were asked how frequently do constituents have an ask? Um, and you can see that's not as frequent. Um, about two fifths of constituents don't have an ask, despite it be, being a very key part of a meeting with a legislator. Um, so what makes up an ask? Um, I wanna break, so I'm just gonna break this down a little bit. Similar to SMART goals, many of your, you might have used at your organization or institution, an ask must be specific, actionable, and achievable. Specific, it's not enough to say support DEI, you need, to, you need to really think about what do you want the legislator to do that, they, that shows that they support diversity, equity, and inclusion. Actionable. This is about your ask being both timely and with, it's within the jurisdiction of the legislator. When you're meeting with the legislator, it's important to know what's in their power to do. This also achievable. This also relates to what, what's in a legislator's power to accomplish, but also encompasses the legislator's history and background. It's both what do they have the power to do and what do they have the political will to do. To give you an extreme example, if your member of Congress sponsored a bill to defund the EPA, they probably don't have the political will to provide additional funding for the EPA. Um, now we get to AGU's recommended ask for the House, Senate, and champions or legislators for whom the above asks really aren't appropriate. If you've had some time to look through the packet, I'd love for you to share which bill or bills you were most interested in asking your legislators to support in the chat. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here because I think the packet provides a great overview of each bill, the importance of each bill, and also the talking points for each bill. Um, I do wanna note a correction here and thank you to Linda for pointing this out to me. Um, the Senate STEM Opportunities Act, the bill number is actually S2579. Oh, and we corrected it, awesome. Um, and I encourage you to do your own research on congress.gov and to look up the press releases for these bills, which also will have some great additional information and possibly um, great additional information and possibly also some additional statistics um, or quotes on the bill that might be useful to you. And we added this last champion ask in recognition that some legislators might have already co-sponsored all of these bills, so they're a champion on this issue, or that this might not, um, or that the above ask might not be appropriate for all legislators. And I'll talk more about this proclamation um, in just a minute. So part of our criteria in choosing these three bills, it's a combination of both bipartisanship, 
you know, have we seen the bill advance in one or both chambers? And how controversial is the bill or idea? Many of these bills and policy ideas are not new and have really gained support over previous con Congresses. And also, you know, changes and edits have been made to improve the bills as well. And this slide shows where the legislation is in the process of becoming law and what steps need to be taken in order for the bill to land on the president's desk. So a little bit more about this proclamation that I mentioned before. So the purpose of this proclamation is to ensure that immigration does not harm the U.S. labor market, especially with unemployment being at record levels right now. In addition to being concerned that the message the proclamation sends might chill the international nation, nature of science and research, AG is concerned about the possibility this proclamation might be extended as well as the guidance within the administration um, to look at more permanent measures to protect American workers. Um, so that kind of big but there at the end. AGLU, along with other science societies, sent a letter to the administration and hundreds of industry leaders also sent a letter expressing concerns about the impact this might have on the science and technology enterprise. Additionally, I recently saw a letter from some members of Congress also expressing concerns about the impact this might have on science. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure to share kind of these letters and resources in the Google Drive as well. And you can read about this proclamation on the White House website. Um, and also, I just want to flag for folks that there are some other concerning proclamations out there. Um, we're just focusing on this one since AGU has kind of released some official, has made an official statement on this. But there are other um, concerning proclamations that do exist that we're aware of as well. Um, so getting back to AGU's um, recommended ask, I wanted to make a couple of final points about this. Um, you know, by all of you, as well as AGU, talking to your legislators about those, these bills, you know, we're hoping with this virtual advocacy day, and I know we can do it, we can uh, create momentum and get these bills moving and passed into law. And while there are many other aspects of DEI and science to tackle with policy, these bills are solid steps to eliminating barriers and creating opportunities for people um, who want to pursue um, STEM careers or, you know, STEM education. And this meeting is really the beginning of a conversation. And these asks are really a tool to help you start a dialogue with your legislator about these issues. This is not a, um, this is not, you know, an end all be all. Additionally, if you have your own ask, I encourage you to first ensure that it's specific, actionable, and achievable. And then to talk through the ask um, with your AGU point of contact for any tips or insights they might have about how to best make that ask. Um, so which ask do you focus on for your representatives? So we created this kind of very simple um, flowchart to help you decide. And I also add that if your representative is from a very urban district and you don't think the rural STEM education bill is relevant to that office, feel free to go straight to asking them to express concerns about the proclamation. Um, and here's very much kind of a similar thing for the Senate. Um, except you have a couple more options. And one thing I'll emphasize here is to please do your homework and look to see what your legislator has done in the DEI space. Even if they haven't co-sponsored one of these specific bills, you look to see if there are other pieces of legislation um, or other policies that, they, that they've supported. Um, you know, thanking the, the staff and legislator at the outset of the meeting always sets a great tone for the conversation. And often if you treat a legislator like a champion on an issue, I think they're encouraged to keep on acting like a champion. They kind of want to live up to, um, they want to live up to that view you have of them. Um, and that's all I have today, but I'm happy to take some questions if people have them. Hi, Brittany. We have, um, we have, we have a really great question from John Henry about how controversial or, and or partisan these bills are. Yeah, so I would say all of these bills are bipartisan, although they might not be bipartisan in both chambers, especially with some of these bills in the Senate. That's one of the things we really hope to accomplish is make these bills bipartisan. Um, and in terms of controversial, most bills um, that are bipartisan that come out of um, the House Science Committee, which all of these bills have, um, are pretty non-controversial. Excuse me. Um, 
we have seen some people have concerns with the um, with the combating sexual harassment in STEM Act, but um, it's mainly concerns um, from the university community concerned about how um, administratively they might enact some of these policies. Um, and I actually think that the sponsors of the bill are open to really working through a lot of those concerns as well. There was also an earlier question about um, whether these bills are open uh, for co-sponsorship by anyone. Can any member of Congress co-sponsor these bills? Yes. Um, so, and I, I want to back up. I apologize for not addressing this earlier. But so if a member of Congress sponsors the bill, that means they introduced the bill or wrote the bill. If they co-sponsor the bill, that means officially on that website, congress.gov, I mentioned that they'll be listed as an official supporter of the bill. And any member of Congress can co-sponsor a bill in their chamber. And then as a follow-up, um, we had a question about whether um, our participants' meetings should focus on advocating for one bill or if they can bring several bills for discussion with the same office. Yeah, um, I would recommend that you, in any meeting, any congressional meeting, have to ask. I think to ask is kind of the max, um, mainly because a lot of congressional meetings are less than 30 minutes. And that um, more than two asks is generally just too much, um, too much ground to cover, if you will, in a meeting. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Michael to take us into our break. Awesome. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to let everybody know um, that we are having, we are going to be holding uh, science policy virtual office hours this coming Friday, uh, June twelfth from uh, 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. So if you are interested and you need some uh, additional help uh, in preparation for your meetings or you have additional questions, um, we have created a Google Doc uh, that is in that share drive folder uh, that I'll be dropping in the chat here shortly. Uh, you can sign up for a block of time. You can come um, individually if you, in, if you have a question by yourself or if uh, you want, if your team wants to come together, um, feel free to sign up um, on that Google spreadsheet. If you cannot make the uh, office hours, feel free to reach out to your AGU point of contact um, at any point of time and we're happy to help you um, with your preparation. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and start our break, our 20-minute break, and I'll drop that link into the chat box for everyone. 